Welcome to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society, whose mission is creating unity through music. And today we are in Adams, Oregon, in Washington, D.C., studio Madams, Oregon. And I'm very pleased to be able to spend some time and talk with a fabulous musician, guy who's really out there. I know a little bit about him, but met him recently, Mr. Rico Amaro Sr. Hello, everybody. How are you? So glad uh, you could take the time, Rico. Uh, you got a gig coming up in a little bit, but we're going to talk a little bit about... Uh, the power of music, and I know music has been a big part of your life. Yes, sir. Um, so, wh- where did you, where were you from, and 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 kind of how did music come into your life? Did your parents play? Did you play? Did you just pick up a guitar when you were one, or did you take lessons in band? How did it all happen? Kind of all of the above. Uh, I was born here in D.C. Yeah. Um, raised in Arlington, um, and uh, I'm the son of. Uh, a very accomplished musician. Really? Um, his name is J.B. Amaro. And uh-huh. he's out of uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Um, what did he play? He plays uh, guitar and sings. Uh, what kind of music? So, uh, he was big in, in the blue-eyed soul in the 70s. Huh? Uh, and today he kind of focuses on uh, uh, a lot of country. He, he, uh, Interesting. He, he still does uh, some of his soul music. Um, his brother is uh, Fly Amaro. Uh, Fly. Fly, yeah, and he is uh, the lead guitarist uh, and one of the singers of Orleans. Uh, oh yeah. yeah, the band Orleans. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so that's what I came from. Uh, so you remember him playing when you were little? Not at all. No, <laughs> <laughs> he. It's very funny. Uh-huh. Um, we reconnected after uh, forty-three years uh, last year. Uh, wow! On stage. No um, way. Yeah, the three of us, uh, and it, it was amazing. Um, but uh, you know, there, uh, he wasn't a part of my life uh, mm. as a kid, and. Um, and that whole side of my family really wasn't. So was it like genes, or did you pick up yeah. music another I, way? You know, the the only instruction he ever gave me as a kid, I was about four years old, and he said, whatever you do, don't be a musician. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, well, he said, you know, um, he said, you, you, you crave that attention, uh, you know, the applause and the love that you get from these people, and it's almost like a drug, and then it's gone. You know, uh-uh. you're alone. Um, and it was kind of like telling the fish to be dry. You know, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. I uh, I knew nothing but music. And so as a kid, I guess I was about five or so. Uh, I My mother put me in guitar lessons. And oh, that is pretty yeah. early. You can hardly hold a guitar. Yeah, I had a little teeny guitar actually yeah it was a left-handed guitar i'm a lefty um and they are too uh they both play upside down um kind of like hendrix except hendrix uh restrung the guitars they just play Uh upside down you know interesting yeah um i I play right-handed oh okay i lost that left-handed guitar somewhere along the lines and found a right-handed one and taught myself how to play so you took Um, lessons pretty early with the guitar i you know i I learned down in the valley you know something like that i took a few lessons uh and then i um later i guess i was maybe seven or eight maybe a little older eight or nine um I uh, took lessons out of Bill Harris's studio. Oh yeah, Bill yeah. Harris, a bass yeah. player, the guitar player, guitar yeah. player. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, maybe his son was a bass player. Or maybe he was a bass. He did have a big giant. My, bass my son there. took some guitar uh-huh. lessons from one of the one yeah. of those guys. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, this guy was kind of nasty to me, and that was oh. it. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't take a lot maybe of lessons, that's what man. Happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and I really kind of walked away from uh, from the guitar for a long time after that. Not out of you know because of that just I, I put it down and um it was because i saw dizzy gillespie uh Ooh. play and um and that was it i wanted to be a trumpet player mm. and so um i uh you know got into the school band um what school did you go to? i was at that time in elementary school and uh, at our savior lutheran 
uh, school in Arlington, nice. uh, a little private school. And so I learned the basics of trumpet and there and went on to middle school at uh, Capital Lutheran High School West, which is gone now. Um, and uh, learned some more. And then after that, I didn't go in the high school band. I didn't want to march. Uh, so I kind of taught myself how to play and I listened uh, to musicians and I sang. Uh, and then I played it. I'd listen, sing, and play. Wow. Which, you know, you taught I, yourself. I did. Yeah. Um, and then flash forward uh, to years later, um, I, d I did wind up in the high school band. And for a short period, I was at Bowie State University. Um, I also went through the D.C. Youth Orchestra for a while. Um, I never could really read music. I, I had a good ear, so I would just memorize the part and play it you know um i was just gonna say just in case anybody hears that i uh, uh, this is like helicopters or something i don't know what went over oh yeah man who knows yeah. i don't know we're up we're on the roof oh, deck here yeah. at madam's Organ. Yeah, welcome to dc it's yeah, helicopter. So i don't even that doesn't even register <laughs> they're not shooting man i'm yeah. <laughs> not a spotlight man. so so know. you so you probably played so you probably played a lot of different kinds of music. What were you really playing when you're, you know, in your teens and early years? You know, I, I really was into jazz, you know, uh -huh. although, I, you know, I, it was funny. I, I was frustrated on the trumpet, you know, um, very, very frustrated. Um, and today I can understand what the frustration was, what I didn't get at the time. It had to do with time, um, I, you know, but I, I labored at it for hours and hours and hours and it i was yeah go ahead it takes a lot of work to, oh, to learn and play music yeah, i am yeah i know that well you know a good friend of mine uh talked to me he, he said he has a, a, a he had a student uh who happened to be a doctor uh was, he was teaching him piano and the doctor said you know he he realized he, he said you know you have studied this longer than i had to study medicine uh -huh. You know, in order to do what you do. He That's said, a good point. Well, because he's realized, you know, he's, he'd been doing this for a couple of years now, and he's nowhere near, you know, and he's, you know, this guy's like a surgeon or something, you know, he's cutting into people after a couple of years, you know what I mean? And, Here you know, go. yeah, you can't even play Tchaikovsky, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 So, um, That's a good yeah. point. It's, uh, yeah, you know, we, we don't get the credit. You know, or the pay that we deserve. Absolutely. For the work that we put into it. Yeah. Yeah, because now you've been playing... 30 years? 40, um, 40. Well, I'm 48, so, <laughs> yeah, you know, 20, I started 20, when I was five. Yeah. Yeah, so. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it does take a long time to get good mm -hmm. to be. Well, and I was singing before that, you know, I've been singing all my life. Yeah. Yeah, you know. And, and so, um, are, are you playing in a bunch of different groups now, or are you, you what, what is no, your. No, not really, no, I, did, I never did like the band, I don't like being in bands although i'm in one but I, i'm learning to like it you know um i just played man i sat in my room and i played and i listened and i listened and i listened and um and i studied things i don't know that uh, you know I, I shouldn't say that other musicians study but i i think i studied them out of sync with the the you know in, in a different order than people study them i was uh -huh. listening to the form of the music and the, and i wasn't like so much um i mean although i was trying to to play the trumpet on a certain level but it, it it's hard to explain man i was listening to the whole to the whole thing and so it was very difficult for me to focus down on on what i was searching for you were sort of letting your listening in your ear lead you to where what where you wanted I had to, to do yeah i guess so well, that's I a beautiful so. way to think about it I, you know it is but you know we're not necessarily geared in that in that way i you know um uh, you know the, the 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 way that i think you know a lot of, of western musicians uh approach music is on paper and pen and which is i mean beautiful i mean that's that's poetry all on its own you know um but uh you know the uh, people who who play by ear or, or what have you i feel like you know we have to overcome a, a certain prejudice or you know maybe it's self-imposed too because i knew so many great players i've been very lucky um and and people who could 
you know, do things with written music and whatever, you know, just on a level that is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that, you know, I have a pretty intimidating past of musicians that I was, you know, exposed to, you know. So, so this is in some ways what you're talking about is is why we're here because I was watching a friend of mine, Jeffrey Allen, who mm. actually uh, interviewed for the podcast earlier, and somebody and I was talking about the podcast, and somebody says you ought to talk with Rico because he's seen a lot. So, I'd love to hear a little bit about you know your sort of your thoughts. Okay. You've now been playing music in a lot for a long time. You've been involved. You do the sound here. Right. You do a lot of different things. What have you seen in terms of music? How it affects people? I mean, mm -hmm. whether it's power or however you want to kind of define it. What are your thoughts about music? Wow. Well, you know, that's huge. I mean, we were we were kind of touching on it earlier. I mean, you know, music possesses the ability to instantly transport you to the time and the place that you heard that music take place you know and and it can put you in that frame of mind um it also i believe can influence your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions um and your actions even um you know what what i wound up doing um after high school um, I, I, I started working in theater and um, I was put in front of a soundboard and the guy that was my, kind of my boss pointed and said, these are the highs, the mids, the lows, turn them until it sounds good and walked away, right? <laughs> and the first person that I did sound for was Keeter Betts and that was Ella Fitzgerald's bass player, right? Oh. And I knew who he was and the reason that that guy sat me down and did that was because I wouldn't let him mix the show cuz he he had a tin ear. He was awful. Mm. And I just I knew, you know, I wasn't going to let him destroy this guy and even though I didn't know how the equipment worked, I knew. You know, Sound. at least I knew what it was supposed to sound like. Yeah, 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 you know. And so I did and 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 I talked to Keeter. Um and Keeter was beautiful. He 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 sat down for a couple of hours, you know, because he got there early and we were there early. And, and you know, he could just see, you know, I was just like this puppy dog, man. I mean, you know, this, I don't know how to explain it. You know, I'm, I'm a grown man now, but I was, you know, I'm about six foot two. And at the time I was about 300 pounds and, I, you know, I look like baby Huey. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> big, you know, kind of chubby, innocent, you know, and, and he could see it, you know, and all of these people that I worked with could see it. And so he sat down, and in and, and those three hours that I, I had with him, he taught me more than I learned in the next three years. Wow. I mean, he, we just talked about all of these things that I'd been wondering about watching this other guy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so from there, I, I, I wound up at Blues Alley. Yeah. You know, and I'm 20 years old, and I'm the engineer at Blues Alley. I'm, well, I'm you see a lot engineer. of folks there. Man, I was there with Dizzy Gillespie my idol you know wow. um I, I did the house sound for the live at blues alley cd you know um, it was my one credit you know? wow went in marsalis uh joe williams on and on lou rawls i mean i got lou rawls to sing happy birthday to my mother you know <laughs> um that's awesome you know but all of these people i talked to you know and ask them questions how do you feel what are you thinking what are you you know and they all sat there and answered me you know and i mean today i realize that i must have been asking good questions you know because you know you've got people who are in their 60s and they just got finished playing their hearts out you know and this fat kid's asking them questions while they're trying to eat their red beans and rice in between <laughs> their set you know what i mean and and you could tell that they were irritated um, you know, because I was interrupting them, but they answered me. Yeah. You know, and then I got picked up by Stanley Turrentine, and he took me around the world with him, um, doing sound. Wow. I you didn't know, know that. until he fired me. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I had no clue. I'm at the Montreal Jazz Festival, um, and I'm about to mix for 5,000 people, right? I'm ne I've mm. never, I'm, you know, I've, <laughs> I've never been anywhere. <laughs> And so I walk up to the soundboard. The soundboard is about 10 feet long, you know, and it's gunmetal gray and it's labeled 
in uh, in in black lettering, right? And there's no buttons like what you see. And any sound engineers out there can remember back in the '90s the old Midas boards, right? Um, so this is a big 32 by eight by whatever Midas board with toggle switches instead of buttons. You know, it looked like a 747. You know, so I stood there for about 10 minutes just staring at it, right? You know, like I have no idea, no idea what to do. So I walk up to the sound engineer, the house guy, and I say, excuse me, what I want you to do is kind of dial stuff in. I'm trying to be cool, right? And, and um, we'll get the plane off the ground, and then I'll take over from there. Uh-huh. And so he looks at me, and he says, huh? <laughs> Montreal Jazz Festival, you know what I mean? It's not, you know, I'm not some backyard jam, you know? And uh, I said, well... I'm still trying to hang on here, right? I said, well, what I want you to do is, you know, just kind of set the levels and dial everything in and just kind of give me a good rough mix. And once uh-huh. you get a rough mix, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take over from there. So he looks at me, he says, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, he understood the, the concept of what I'm saying, but he could not believe these words are coming out of my mouth. So finally, I was forced to tell him that, you know, I... I I really have no idea how any of this stuff works, man, but I have good ears. Yeah. You know, and trust me. And so I'm this is a long way getting back to where what what you asked me about the effect of music. Mm. Um what I did after that point was I let go. And a friend of mine said to me a long time ago that if you take care of the music, the music will take care of you. And so I closed my eyes and I listened. And I knew that what he had done was painted a good, rough picture. And then I put that picture into focus. And people came out of the crowd, right? And they said, did you mix the show? And I said, yeah, because there were other shows Mm -hmm. that had gone on before. And they said, we could tell when you took over. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, and when I would talk to Turn Team, uh, I, I didn't just do sound for him he took me under his wing again up until he fired me it was just funny because like i said i really had no idea what i was doing but he was fascinated by me um because of all those questions that i asked and he i touched him and so he would pick me up he lived in kensington i was in silver spring at the time and we would drive through rock creek park and go have lunch and whatever and he would tell me about his ideas about music and life you know, you know about music and life, and, and you know so forth and so on. And one of the things that he told me was that the job of a musician was to move people. He said, "You either move their hearts or you move their asses, but you have to move them." Yep. You know, that sounds right. Absolutely. You know, and so our job is to communicate the emotions, okay, that were intended by whoever it was that wrote this piece of music. You know, that's our job. And to communicate our experience in life, you know. And so I've seen music change people. I've seen it change me, you know. I've watched it in my children who perform with me, you know. And when we perform together, I see the looks on people's faces. And, you know, you talk about bringing people together and that joy. And... I, I mean, that's that's what I do. I spread joy. Sometimes I make you cry. Sometimes I make you laugh. Sometimes I make you dance. You know, but my job is to make you do that. And that's right? what music, I mean, that Man. Blues Alley, all these things. You've, all you've seen thousands of people in the audience. Hey, man. Look, now you don't even need Blues Alley. I mean, which is, yeah, right? But look, you switch on a Motown tune, Okay. Switch on a Motown tune. I don't care who you are. Exactly. You're going to start moving. Right. You have no choice. (laughs) You have no choice. I I proved that to a guy. Um, A friend of mine opened a bar, the Light Horse, down in Old Town, Alexandria. Um, I love those people. That's that's where I started performing about 10 years ago. So, uh, and I also, you know, follow you a bit on social media. Uh I know you have views about things which are kind of of similar to mine. And we don't have time to (laughs) go into all that, but... What other things can we do? What would you tell musicians? What would you tell non-musicians? What would you tell everybody about with this power of music, what you've seen in your life? You got any ideas? Because we're trying to get this conversation going at the yeah. Planetary Gig Society and, and these podcasts about just let's talk more about how we can really, really make a difference and overcome 
this craziness that we've got. Right. I, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I, you know, my wife says that I'm I'm a snob, a music snob, and maybe I am. You know, but again, I have been exposed to some of the greatest musicians that have ever walked on the face of the earth. All right, so I know what excellence is. And so I know what excellent is not, okay? And so what I implore people to do first off is listen to excellent music, you know? Now, it doesn't mean don't have fun, you know? It doesn't mean be like me and not let your kids listen to that trash, Mm. okay? (laughs) That was me. Okay, I'm not saying you have to do that. You know, I'd be fine if you did, but you don't have to do that. But you have to have a healthy diet of quality. Go see live music. Go support live music. You know, spend that $5. You know, spend that $10. You know what I mean? I mean, people will go see Britney Spears, man, and they'll pay $50 to see her lip sync junk. You know what I mean? Stuff you could turn the TV on and see for free, and you're not really going to get a better show. And there's no difference. You know what I mean? And and they'll they'll spend like crazy money to see that. People were spending six hundred dollars to see the Eagles. You know, which I mean, they're great. God bless them. But you know, all of those guys had Rolls Royces and you know all of that shit, man. I, you know, I was a single father raising three kids, trying to figure out how I was going to feed my kids and feed my soul. You know. And and I'm worth ten bucks. You know what I mean. I, I I know I am. You know I put the time in, and I'm good at what I do. I've seen too many people be affected by what I do to be shy about that anymore. You know, too many people that I respect have said, "Man, look at you! Wow!" You know, I remember when you were doing sound for me. A lot of these guys that I mix down here, I'm doing sound again, full circle, uh, are guys that trained me. Johnny Artist just had his last Thursday here, um, and my band, Cluster Funk, um, is going to be replacing uh, him. We're not replacing him, but we're taking the Thursday night slot. You can't replace mm-hmm. Johnny Artist. I was 18 years old working with Johnny Artist. You know, Johnny was training me then, and he was training me now. I was working with him every Thursday, and I'm like, man, this is. I'm, here I am. And then he was training my son. My son's 18 years old and he comes in here and makes a sound. That's some great advice, you know, just listening to good music and we, you obviously have seen the power of music in your life and I appreciate you taking the time to do this, to talk uh, with us and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, be around and see you soon, but thanks very much. Uh, Rico Amaro Sr. Thank appreciate you very much. It. it. was my pleasure. Come see us at, uh, at Madam's Organ every Thursday night, uh, 930. All right. All right. Take care. You've been listening to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society. We talk with musicians and others about the power of music and how we can use music to help create a better world. Please check out our website, www.planetarygigs.org, for information about some of the organizations promoting music and musicians. Resources about the power of music. Books, movies, articles, including new research on music and the brain. We welcome your support. Planetary Gig Society is a Section 501c3 charitable organization, and you can donate on the website. You also can receive a free email signature block demonstrating your support for Planetary Gig Society. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Planetary Gigs. And we want to thank fabulous musician and teacher. Eric Weinberg of Little Eric Studios for the Planetary Gig Talk music titled Chill Kid, It's Saul. So please check out Planetary Gig Talk on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Subscribe and hear all the upcoming episodes. Thanks very much.